In this video, we will talk about the second part of the Deuteronomistic history. We will begin by talking about the Book of Samuel, the establishment of the Davidic Covenant, then moving into the Book of Kings, and a discussion of the Temple and Tabernacle, as well as the Golden Age of Israel. The next video in the series will cover in detail more about the kings we see in the Book of Kings. To begin with, the Book of Samuel is the third book in the Deuteronomistic history. If you recall, the Deuteronomistic history is the compilation of books of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, sometimes including Deuteronomy as an introduction or prologue. All of these books are believed to have been written by one author or one group of authors with the same purpose. Some of the concerns that we see with the Deuteronomistic history are seen in Samuel and Kings as well. These include the centralized worship at the temple, the emphasis on the Davidic covenant, and worship exclusively of Yahweh. The book of Samuel, which is composed of 1st and 2nd Samuel, and originally was one composition, has three major sections. It begins with a discussion of Samuel the prophet, moves into the anointment of Saul as the first king of Israel, and ends with a discussion of David, who seems to be the primary focus of the book. The narrative of the book of Samuel begins with the prophet Samuel, who is called to be a Nazarite, taking the vow to be separated, consecrated, or set apart by not cutting his hair or drinking alcohol. As a priest and a prophet, he is important to the religious life of the Israelites. One of the ways he does this is by anointing kings. He anoints the figure of Samuel as the very first king of the united monarchy of Israel. Second, he anoints David as the second king of Israel. The anointing of David leads to what we call the Davidic Covenant. The Davidic Covenant has a few key characteristics. As we've talked about in previous videos, a covenant is a contract made by two parties. Each has certain terms to uphold. For the Davidic Covenant, the covenant is primarily on the side of God. God promises that David's line will be everlasting. And there's some kind of importance of Mount Zion or Jerusalem, as well as the temple in Jerusalem, as factors of this Davidic Covenant. The promise here is that the covenant will always continue through David's lineage. The Book of Kings continues the narrative of the United Monarchy of Israel. The United Monarchy refers to the kings of Saul, David, and Solomon. Under Solomon's reign, however, the monarchy is split into two kingdoms. The southern kingdom of Judah, which contains the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, and the northern kingdom of Israel, which contains the other ten tribes. Solomon's lineage continues in the southern kingdom of Judah, rather than the northern kingdom of Israel, and Judah is where Jerusalem and the temple are located at this time. The following video will discuss in a lot more detail about the kings of both of these kingdoms and why the split occurred. What we see in Samuel and Kings is an emphasis on kings, priests, and prophets. Kings are the rulers of the Israelite civilization. These are figures like Saul, David, Solomon, Ahab, and so on. The priests are the religious leaders. The high priest would be the person who is responsible for making the sacrifice in the temple on the Day of Atonement every year. The high priest acted almost like a king taking the, the religious roles while the king took the leadership roles. The two typically functioned together in guiding the Israelite civilization. Prophets were messengers of Yahweh. Prophets could be priests, but were not always. As we talk about the priests and prophets of the Israelite civilization, 
we need to talk about two buildings to begin with. The first of these is the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a movable tent that housed the Ark of the Covenant and was built in the book of Exodus. The tabernacle was believed to house the presence of Yahweh. Some Jews considered this to mean that Yahweh himself literally physically lived in the tabernacle, in the most holy place, while some believed it was simply his presence and that Yahweh could be felt around in other places as well. You can notice here the very simple setup of the tabernacle with one altar of incense, one golden candlestick, one laver, and so on. The tabernacle was meant for a nomadic society who moved from place to place and needed to be able to pack up the tabernacle to move it along with them. As the Israelites settled in Jerusalem, they needed to build a permanent structure to house the Ark of the Covenant. This was called the temple. The first temple, or Solomon's temple, which is drawn here, was believed to be the permanent dwelling place for the Ark of the Covenant and the presence of Yahweh. Solomon's temple was built during the reign of Solomon and stood until 586 BCE when it was destroyed by the Babylonians. The Torah takes on importance later in Judaism during the exile when the temple was destroyed. But up until this point, the central focus of ancient Judaism was the temple. Animal sacrifices took place here. The high priest offered each year for atonement for the nation of Israel. This is a layout of what Solomon's temple would have looked like. If you notice, there are a lot more intricacies than there were with the tabernacle. There are many more lavers and basins. There are more altars of incense, more tables of shoe bread, and more candlesticks as well. The high priest in the temple, as previously mentioned, was responsible for making the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. The high priest was the leader of all the priests of Israel. The first high priest in the temple, when it was built, was a figure named Zadok. Zadok was the high priest who ruled alongside Solomon as king. Because of Zadok's importance in what we call the Golden Age of Israel, the United Monarchy, Zadok was believed to be the person from whom all legitimate priests needed to be descended. Remember, all priests were descendants of the Levites, but this began a further split between Levites who were Zadokites and Levites who were not Zadokites. Zadok was a descendant of Aaron, and his name literally meant righteous. This takes on importance much later in Judaism when we talk about the Maccabees, who were not considered to be legitimate priests by many Jews because even though they were Levite, they were not Zadokite. Other important figures that we'll see in the book of Samuel and Kings are prophets. Prophets are messengers of God who take roles to perform miracles, speak on behalf of God, sometimes predict the future, and most prominently for our purposes in this video, to provide some kind of commentary on the kingship. For the United Monarchy, this commentary is relatively mild. For example, Samuel functions as a prophet, and he provides some critique on Saul's reign, but mostly helps guide him in his journey of being a king, as he does with David. Nathan similarly provides minimal critique of David's kingship. For the most part, Nathan critiques David's relationship with Bathsheba, but simply guides David as a king. However, in the Book of Kings, the figures of Elijah and Elisha function as prophets who critique the kingship. In this picture shown in the middle of this slide, you can see Elijah offering a sacrifice to Yahweh and a competition between the prophets of Baal under the reign of King Ahab. Ahab was a king who instituted worship of Baal, the Canaanite storm god.
Now that we have arrived at the end of this video, you should be able to explain the structure and general contents of the books of Samuel and Kings, describe the importance of figures like David, Solomon, and Zadok, note the differences and reason for them between the tabernacle and the temple, and explain the role of prophets in the Deuteronomistic history.